welcome everyone. Um, it's good to have you all here again. There, it's been a while. I think our last meetup was back in July, so nearly two months. So it's good to have you all here. Another microservices meetup. Um, so in case you haven't seen yet, toilets are here to my right. We have beer at the back, and uh, we're gonna have pizza coming up after the talk. And yeah, I guess that's it. We have uh, Richard Rogers here today, and uh, he's going to be talking a little bit about uh, microservices failures. That's all you know. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, today there is uh, just me, so I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then um, we'll have a, a bit of a Q and A session. Um, how many people are using microservices in production? Put up your hands. Awesome. Okay, so uh, I want you guys to sense check what I'm saying because I'm, it'll be really interesting uh, to compare uh, our experiences versus yours and see um, you know what we've learned versus what you guys have learned. The importance of various different things. Um, so uh, this talk is uh, this talk is about how microservices fail. So this is um, kind of a collection of things that, that uh, my company Nearform has learned over the last three years, starting out building very simple, very small microservice systems where it was just point-to-point -point HTTP, uh, all the way up to uh, coming up with different approaches and different architectures and uh, framework to do microservices and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's really trying to put all that knowledge together in one place uh, so that when uh, people who haven't built microservice systems before uh, can kind of understand the pitfalls. And this intersects um, quite a lot with uh, a lot of the issues around uh, message-oriented architectures and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the best books that I've read about microservices recently uh, is a book that was written... Uh, it was, it, the guy who wrote it first started writing it in 2006, I think. Um, and he only finished it in 2011. Uh, it's called Solo Patterns by Manning. Um, the guy who wrote it has really crazy names, like Gotem Al Nar or something like that. Um, and he goes through a whole bunch of Solo Patterns, which a lot of them discuss failure modes in uh, in Solo architectures and message architectures, and they are directly relevant to microservices. Uh, it's just that micro with microservices these issues actually become far more critical. Um, so, uh, anybody follow this stuff that happened last Sunday in Amazon? Anybody affected by this? Hey! <laughs> uh, it's a cheap shot, guys. But, um, so, Amazon had a, an outage uh, last Sunday, uh, 20th of September. Uh, and you can see some of the, the quotes on Twitter, which I think are awesome. Uh, eventually consistent after a few hours. Brilliant. Um, so, the underlying issue, and if you follow the link, you can kind of read their big post-mortem. Uh, the underlying issue here is a really, really simple failure mode where uh, a metadata service that was providing metadata about the mapping from DynamoDB partitions to the servers that those partitions were being served from, that metadata service wasn't able to handle an increased load. So there was a minor network outage, um, which meant that the metadata had to be refreshed. Uh, but uh, a new indexing feature had been introduced into DynamoD a couple of months back, which meant that the metadata had uh, grown exponentially in size in certain cases. And the metadata services, the metadata service itself, all the instances of it were not able to handle increased load. So you had a classic a uh, thundering herd problem where as a system boots up, uh, thousands and thousands of systems make the same request and the underlying services can't handle it. Um, so this is a classic, this is a classic failure mode in microservice architectures where uh, you build a set of microservices and you aren't handling case where uh, you hit the microservices with too much capacity. What happens? And if you haven't designed about it or thought about it, what happens is that you end up with uh, really weird latency spikes. Your, your average response times might be reasonably okay, but some people experience extreme latency 
and you have high unpredictability and weird failures and all that sort of stuff. Um, which leads to uh, the question, what are the best ways to mitigate that problem? Um, and one of the best ways to mitigate a case where you can't handle load is actually to just drop load on the floor. Uh, it's called load shedding. You just throw away the messages. Uh, so it's, it's those types of failures and those types of failure modes that we're trying to understand here, trying to analyze and trying to put into a structure so that it's easy for developers from the junior level, level up to think in terms of, have I done the right thing here? Is my system uh, fault tolerant for all these kind of well-known failure cases? Uh, to motivate the example and to motivate the discussion, <laughs> I thought I'd use a, a real system. So, I, ages ago we wrote uh, this thing called nosy.com, which is a little search engine for Node.js modules. And it's a, uh, I guess, an experimental microservice system in that it has, a, it's, a, it's a small system, but it does real work. Uh, it's composed of a, a small bunch of microservices. So it's relatively easy to grok what's going on. Um, and all it does really is uh, get updates from npmjs.org, which is the registry of Node.js modules, indexes them in Elasticsearch, uh, applies a little ranking algorithm, and the system itself uh, just stores the data about each module. So it's an incredibly simple system, but pulled apart into microservices. And if you look at what those microservices are, Here's a classic sort of boxes and arrows diagram, right? So you have a web server where somebody types in the query. There's a search microservice that talks to Elasticsearch. Uh, there's an info microservice which, if you ask the uh, if you ask the, the site to tell me about Express, will pop up a little page telling you about the number of stars that Express has, that sort of stuff. Uh, there's an update microservice which listens to changes from npm JS. So whenever we, anybody publishes a module. Uh, it'll listen for those updates and then it'll update Elasticsearch and all that sort of stuff. And then there's two other microservices, uh, npm and, and git, which talk to npm.js and talk to github.com and get metadata. So they're a very, a very, very, very simple system. But you can see that this diagram has a massive problem, right? It is boxes and arrows, tons of arrows. And you can imagine if you build a real system, you end up with massive amounts of boxes and arrows. This is a problem that we uh, started experiencing when we were trying to design these systems. How do you actually specify a microservices system? How do you draw a, an architecture diagram? Which is, you know, this is a, essentially what that is. Uh, and the problem is, once you, if you just use the standard techniques, um, it becomes very hard to see what's going on, even if you pull it apart into different sections. And that led us to uh, thinking about microservices in a slightly different way. Uh, which is to apply two key principles. Uh, one is pattern matching on the messages, and the other is transport independence. Uh, so pattern matching means instead of uh, knowing the location of a service, instead of having service discovery, uh, you look at the content of a message and decide what to do with it based on the content. So if I recognize that it's a search message from the web, microservice that's meant to go to the search microservice. Uh, the web microservice doesn't know where the search microservice is, but the routing mechanism does know that if it sees a microservice, it sees a message that's a search message, it should send it to the search microservice. So you've decoupled the web microservice and the search microservice. They don't know about each other. There's no DNS lookups or URLs or uh, message you topics or any of that sort of stuff. You get full decoupling. Uh, transport independence is the flip side of that coin. So a microservice doesn't know how a message gets from one place to another. It might be pointed by HTTP, it might be a message queue, it might be Redis pub server, you just don't know. And again, that's another really important facet of, of keeping control of the system. Um, so if you take those two principles, uh, what you do is you take a look at the content of message and then use that to decide where it goes. And here's an example message. So this is somebody types in a query and it generates a message that looks like this, which is just a bit of JSON. And the query that they typed in was LDAP. Um, and then I've added some 
markers the message. Uh, one is rel search, which means this message is uh, for whatever set of microservices implement search for the general value of search in the system. Search as a, as a functionality, as a feature of the system, might be implemented by many microservices. It's, it's, it's a role that a group of microservices might uh, implement. And then command is uh, search, which just means that this, is, this type of message fits into the general mode of uh, the command pattern. So when I send this message, I'm saying, please do a search. And then you can see that I, I can specify a pattern to all those identify these types of messages. And the pattern is if row is equal to search and command is equal to search, just string matching. Uh, and that will pick out any of these messages for me. So you can start thinking about a microservice system in terms of messages, in terms of messages being first class citizens. So in term, instead of thinking about uh, this diagram, what are the services? You ask the question, what are the messages? And you can specify the messages using the set pattern. So if you think for a minute about a little search engine for node modules, it's going to have some fairly obvious messages. Um, the one to do the search, the one to insert something into Elasticsearch, uh, a message to get module information so I can display it on a page, um, a message that uh, means go out to the NPM registry and get some, get some data from the NPM registry. Um, whenever there's an update because somebody's published a module, I want to publish a message that says, hey, this module has been updated. Whoever is interested in indexing it or logging it or whatever, do some work. Uh, and then when I'm building the information page for a module, that information, uh, like I said, comes from NPM and it comes from Git. But you know what? I might be grabbing like the latest uh, information from Twitter or uh, uh, you know from build servers, that sort of stuff. So I might have a whole bunch of different microservices that are getting information. So when I want to view the page, I can just emit a uh, message that says, give me some information for this module, and then whichever microservices are out there, provide some information. So that's the last two, that's the last two messages. And you can see how I thought about the system in terms of messages. I've specified the messages using these patterns. They give me namespacing. They give me a little language to talk about. And I haven't really thought about what the services are. Uh, and that's, that's really useful because I can assign these messages to any service. Maybe it's just one monolith that does everything. Um, I can route the messages in different ways. I can uh, bifurcate them at different points. Um, but my specification of the functionality of the system is expressed as messages. And now I can turn that around and I can say, okay, well actually I need to build this thing. So what services am I actually going to use and how are the messages going to flow between the services? <laughs> So let's look at the uh, simple case, which is the website. Uh, and in this case, you have a uh, search page. And if I swap back. So this is the search page. Uh, I typed in a search for uh, why, and I got back some results. And then if I look for uh, information about an individual module, I get back information from NPM and Git, uh, which is what which is what these set of services do for me. So the web service is obviously delivering web pages. The search service is talking to Elasticsearch. The info service is grabbing information from GitHub and NPM. Um, and I'm, I want those to be nice and fast and low latency. So I'm going to use point to point HTTP. So I'm sending synchronous request response style messages. Uh, one of them is role search command search. Another is role info command get. These are, uh, this is a kind of a, a very classic microservice system. Um, and if you look at uh, Sam Newman's book, uh, Building Microservices, he talks a lot about this style of system where you're just doing point-to-point -point HTTP. Um, and if you're using service discovery, you're going to be using DNS or something like that to find out the endpoints. Um, from our perspective, 
we don't know how the message transport is happening. It's just point to point. As far as you're concerned, it's just synchronous. There's another style of messaging, which is where there's an update from MPM because somebody's published a module, and I just want to announce this fact. And the NPM microservice is going to take that message and say, okay, this module has been updated, go to the registry, get the full details, index it, store, whatever. And in this case, I'm sending an asynchronous message because I don't care about any responses. I just want to tell the world that the module has been updated. Um, and in this case, you might have a whole bunch of NPM microservices that listen for these messages and then go and get the data. Uh, so this also raises another thought experiment around failure, because let's imagine that in this sequence between somebody typing npm publish, it going onto the npm registry, I'm listening for updates on my update service, and then my npm service is storing the data in some way. That is not always going to work 100% of the time. It's going to fail, let's say, 1% of the time. Which means that if I have one instance of each of these microservices, I might get a 1% failure rate. I only get 99% of the data. Uh, and this is where the microservice architecture has a, a really nice way of dealing with uh, failure, failure rates like this. Because if I know, for example, that the NPM uh, service has a 1% failure rate, I know that by adding more instances of it, the failure rate of the entire system decreases according to the laws of probability. You just multiply the failure rates together, and that's your base failure rate. So I can change the behavior of the system. I can meet an SLA, I can meet performance goals, simply by replicating the number of microservices. Uh, and that's a nice advantage over Mongols, because it gives you a very direct control over the rate of failure in the system. Uh, so this model is, this messaging model anyway, is, you might otherwise know it as actor, right? So there's, you might have one updater and a whole bunch of NPMs, and as messages come in, the NPM services just pull them off the queue and do some work. Uh, another model is a fire and forget model, which is also asynchronous. Uh, and in this case, uh, this is how I'm implementing the intro page where I might have additional pieces of information down the road that I just want to plug into the system. And in this case, whenever I want to show a page for a given module, I just emit uh, role info request part, and whoever's interested responds with role info response part. Uh, you kind of scatter the need and then gather up the responses. Uh, in this case, the messages are observed rather than con consumed. So in the previous one, the NPM service consumes that message. But in this case, it doesn't consume. So this actually leads you to um, a model for microservice messages. If you just work through all the different cases, messages are either synchronous or asynchronous. And they're either observed or consumed, which leads you to four cases. We've already seen three, right? The first one is the synchronous request response, HTTP. Um, asynchronous winner take all is a uh, standard message queue. And the asynchronous uh, fire and forget is a pub sub. Uh, one other one that we haven't looked at yet is uh, a synchronous one where uh, the target microservice does provide a response, but there might be other people listening. So for example, if I have an audit microservice that listens to traffic between other microservices and logs what's going on, even though it doesn't provide a response itself. Uh, so we can use this structure to kind of analyze the different failure modes. Um, to kind of give you a little bit of, uh, a little bit more material for thought, um, I'm just going to drop down into the code that implements this node to stuff and stuff we've been looking at, uh, just so you can kind of fit that into um, the failure modes as we talk about them. Uh, the Node2 system is implemented in Node.js and it's implemented with the Seneca microservices framework, uh, which is an open source microservice, microservices framework that we've been working on for a couple of years. Um, it provides a lot of uh, failure mitigation as well. 
Um, and you'll see that that's one of the reasons that we use it. Uh, so I'm going to drop into the code for this uh, node 2 thing now. And what we're going to look at is not, uh, not so much the implementation code, the uh, HTTP requests out to uh, the NPM registry or talking to Elasticsearch and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to focus much more on the uh, piece of the system where you wire up the services so that they work together. So, I'm going to have to speak louder. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Okay. So, uh, the web service, the thing that runs the website, is a uh, Kraken.js website and runs in its own little world. So, we won't worry too much about that. All I'll do is uh, spin it up initially. Which means that I have a, a working website. Except that I can't search for anything because I have no other microservices. So the system is the system is broken. Um, but inside the node to GitHub, you can see that I've uh, provided a number of uh, runtime configurations of these services. So each of these services lives in its own GitHub repository, but I've just brought them all together in one place. Uh, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm just running them vanilla on the command line. In production, you would package them up into Docker, or if you're running a really, really high scale, you'd package them up into Amazon Images or something like that. Um, but just to keep things simple, I'm just running them directly from the command line. Uh, so the, uh, the search service is the most useful one uh, in terms of what we're doing here. And if I fire that up, then we now have search results. Happy days. Uh, if I look at the configuration that runs the search service, uh, you can see that I'm pulling in the implementation here. And then I'm listening on a hard-coded port. And what that means is that any messages that are sent to that port on localhost, the search service looks at them, and if it recognizes them, if, the, if it matches the pattern, then it will act on them. If it doesn't match the pattern, it's going to drop them on the floor. And in particular, it's looking for role search, command search, or role search, command insert. And if you look at the logs, sure. wrapping here, but um, there's my search for foo down there. And if I go to the, uh, the other side, and then I have to search for I have a search for foo over here as well. And this is just on point to point HTTP. I could hook up these things using uh, RabbitMQ or Redis or whatever. Uh, it's completely incidental to the actual implementation. The Decoupling is important. When I implemented the search and when I implemented the web, I didn't know how this. Was, I didn't know how they were going to be hooked together. Uh, the next service, which is really important, is the uh, updater. Uh, this listens to npm js and generates update events. Um, and again, we don't really care how it does that. Um, but what we are saying here is that any time there is a change event, I'm just going to publish it on the Beanstool. And then the other side of that equation is uh, the NPM service itself. Uh, and in particular, it's listening for those messages. So whenever something changes in NPM, I'm going to get an update. Uh, so let's try and run that. So I'm going to run the NPM, uh, NPM registry observer here, and then I'm going to run the uh, NPM microservice here. Uh, and then we sit and wait for somebody to publish. Or we can publish something ourselves. Um, so I just happen to have a test. 
I just have to have a test microservice or t test MD MDM module that I can publish. And if I push that out, you can see this work starting to happen. And you can see my version verify test has gone through. In this case, the message transport happened using a message bus. And the framework looked after doing the pattern match. I didn't say set up this topic and communicate in this way. Um, as far as my Oracle services are concerned, I'm just emitting messages and I'm just checking for patterns. Um, the uh, info message that pulls in information from Git and NPM works using Redis pub sub. So what you're seeing here is message queue is an actor model. The info one is pub sub. Uh, if you look at its, its hookups, you can see that it's just using Redis pub sub and it's listening for um, uh, response messages and it's emitting requests. So you have this relatively simple system, uh, but a system which demonstrates uh, the asynchronous request response, it demonstrates the, uh, uh, the actor model, it demonstrates pub sub. Uh, I don't have auditing, but uh, I am actually using the Sidewinder one to track uh, message flow rates. Uh, so you have all of the different ways that two microservices can communicate in this system. Um, and it's a, useful, it's a useful one to use as a test case for failure mitigation strategies. Um, so for example, uh, one of the ones that we're experimenting with at the moment, and uh, I'd be interested to hear uh, how anybody else has solved this particular problem. Um, if you have microservice A and microservice B, and uh, microservice A, let's say, is uh, accepting responses which are really high at lunchtime and really low at midnight, you can kind of model that as a sine wave, let's say. Um, microservice B does real work, so it can't handle the high level of rate for microservice A. But what it can do is have an overflow buffer where it just stores messages until it can work on them. So as long as that sine wave goes down again, microservice B can catch up and keep doing work. The problem is, uh, you don't, for microservice A, if it pushes microservice B too hard, B is going to fall over. So B should announce the fact that it's too busy and get A to back off a little. And the question is, what's the best algorithm mathematically to let B to let A know that B is overloaded? And don't forget, there's multiple Bs and there's multiple As, and none of them know how many others there are. Right? So uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, one of the one of the uh, approaches that we're taking is uh, to um, maybe take the uh, differential of the samples from B uh, that gives you a line, and if the line the slope of the line is zero, that means there's no change. That means you're okay. This type of stuff. Um, I'd be very interested to hear how other people have addressed that problem. If you have. Uh, okay, so microservices have a particular philosophy to building systems, and um, I think it's nicely uh, kind of encapsulated by uh, Kintsugi, which is a Japanese art form. Um, so this is an art form that arose in the 15th century, and what it is is uh, a way to repair broken pottery, valuable pottery, obviously. Uh, you take lacquer and you mix in uh, gold powder and then you stick the, the piece of pottery back together again. And actually it turns out to look even better than the original. Um, and the, the legend is that uh, the uh, 15th century shogun, whose name I will not attempt to pronounce, um, he, he this was the era of like the tea ceremonies and that sort of stuff, and uh, he, he broke a really important tea ceremony bowl and sent it back to China to have it fixed. And he came back from China with metal uh, studs in it, which looked really ugly. Uh, and then he challenged, the Shogun challenged his craftsmen to come, come up with a better way of repairing pottery, and this is what they came up with. Uh, and that led, in short order, to people breaking really expensive pieces of pottery deliberately so they could fix them again. Um, 
But the philosophy is really cool because the philosophy is actually one that we should uh, apply to large scale systems, which is to embrace breakage and embrace failure um, and use it to make the system more robust. So let's refer to this model. Right? So this is just a mental model for microservices. I'm, I'm sure there are others. Um, but it, I think it gives us a nice model to ask, okay, for each case, what are the primary ways that microservices fail? And um, these failure modes are not uh, exclusive. Right? They apply in different cases. Um, so has anybody here uh, had, had the uh, good fortune or otherwise to have worked with um, management consultants at any stage? Um, <laughs> So there's this thing called MISI, right, which stands for uh, Mutually Exclusive, Collectively Exhaustive, which means that you take uh, a set of things and you break them into parts and there's no intersections and the union of all the parts is the same as the whole thing. Uh, that's not the case here. These failure modes apply to varying degrees to all these different ways of interacting. Um, but there's certainly failure modes that are more prevalent for certain types of interaction. So if you look at the synchronous request response type messages, uh, one really common failure mode is the slow downstream. This is what happened to Amazon last Sunday, where a microservice A depends on B, the B is slowing down, B can't handle the load. Uh, it's particularly nasty in a thread-based environment because you start blocking on threads, and eventually all your threads are consumed and you can't go anywhere. Um, less nasty in event-based systems, but it still choose memory. Um, the mitigation is to drop bad servers. Uh, and this is colloquially known as the, the circuit break. So you drop B if you find that B is bad. Now, this is where uh, your framework should come in, because if you're, if you're building microservices, your toolkits and libraries and fra frameworks should be doing this type of thing for you. If you're doing this yourself, um, well, the only reason to do it yourself is if you're building such a high load system that you have to have a special implementation. But in general, at this point, in late 2015, if you're doing microservices and you're not using a library that can do this for you, um, and you know, like Netflix, uh, for example, is tons of, there's many, many examples of this type of strategy. Uh, upstream overload is a different type of problem. And it was actually, this is basically the one I was talking about earlier. Um, this is where B can't handle the rate. Um, but you've set things up so that it can message back to A. So this is back pressure. Right? You're saying to A, slow down. Don't send me so much stuff. If you, don't, if you just naively build two microservices and you just let A pummel B with as many messages as possible, you end up in that weird place where you have weird latency and all that sort of stuff. Um, again, you have to ask the question, are the libraries and frameworks and tooling that you're using able to do this? Um, the Seneca framework that we use doesn't do this natively, um, but it does make it very easy to build custom plugins to do this. Um, and we have done it in one or two cases. Um, you know, so once you do something three times, you turn it into a library. Uh, a synchronous message, except it has side effects. So in this case, A is sending messages to B, and C is listening in on them. Uh, except that C sometimes loses messages. What's going on? Is C uh, failing? Is the transport mechanism failing? Who knows what's going on? Uh, one of the ways to mitigate against this in production is to make sure that you have the expected flow rates between messages. Um, so, uh, I'll just drop out of this quickly. This may or may not be working. Uh, we use IndexedDB to do this. Uh, so, for example, I am tracking the uh, uh, search messages and I'm tracking the change messages. Actually, they're not related, so this is a really bad example. But if you track the flow rates of messages, I should end up with a little chart uh, that looks like this, where A is spitting out a message. I know that. C, C should have a message, and I know that B should have a message. So the ratio of the flow rate should be 2 to 1 over time. Right? So I, I do them in one second segments or something like that. And you can see in this case that uh, it should be 2, but it's slightly under 2. So something's going wrong. 
And typically, you see this when you have a, work, a, a known good system, and then you deploy a new version of B or C, and suddenly something's old. Right? You have 10 versions of C, and you upgrade one of them because you're doing a partial deployment, and suddenly your numbers start going fun. Uh, which means roll back, right? And if you're using Docker, it's much easier. Uh, broken contracts. So this is, uh, this is a, an area of some controversy. Um, because what we found is that it's much better for microservice systems not to use contracts between microservices, not to have strict schemes between microservices. And the reason is you want to actually run multiple different versions of the same microservice because you want to migrate slowly over time because that's a more robust way of doing things. If you use contracts, you often end up in this case where you forget to upgrade something and something breaks on So the solution here isn't so much uh, engineering or anything like that. It's just adopting a stance, which is uh, Postel's law, right? Strict in what you emit and lenient in what you accept. The asynchronous actor model has a different set of failure modes. Um, one of the nicest ones, uh, which we've seen in production, is the poison message. Who's been hit by poison messages in their work as a developer? <laughs> um, this is a lovely, horrible, nasty failure mode where there's some bug or logic error in B. And A is happily generating messages that it thinks are valid. And B gets the message and crashes. And the message goes back in the queue. And then B comes up again and tries again and fails. And now you have 100 Bs and they all fail. So the whole system is logged out and nothing can actually move forward. Uh, again, this happens when you implement systems naively. Uh, so for example, Seneca will uh, keep track of the most recently seen messages, and if it gets duplicates, it will drop them on the floor because it knows that something strange is happening. Um, another uh, important thing to do in, to mitigate against this case, because it will happen anyway, is a dead letter log. So that's where, if you see weird messages or broken messages, record them somewhere. Right? It's no good just putting them in your, uh, your console.app or somewhere like that. These things get lost and they get merged and they get forgotten. Um, weird messages should go into a dead letter queue. It's really important to analyze them to see what on earth is actually going on. You can also use that error queue to replay these messages and when replay you fix your yes. problem. Uh, and I would say use Kafka, but I know that somebody will throw things at me if I say that. <laughs> um, so the other one is uh, naivety about uh, message systems. Um, so uh, who has uh, who's heard of the Byzantine generals problem? Has anybody read about that? <laughs> you guys have lots of fun with this stuff. <laughs> so, the, let's imagine you are laying siege to a city in Mesopotamia. Or, yeah, it, it'd be Mesopotamia. Or Turkey. And um, you have two generals. And one, one of the generals is the uh, field marshal. Uh, he or she is, the, is the, the leader. And that general decides to attack. Now, there's 10,000 soldiers in the city, defending the city. And you have 6,000 in your first army, and you have 6,000 in your second army. So if both armies attack together, that's 12,000 versus 10,000, you win. If one army attacks, you lose. So you have to attack at the same time. So the idea is, let's attack at dawn. The only way you have to communicate is by sending a messenger, a runner, through the valley, past the city, and up to the other, the other general. Of course, the uh, defenders of the city know that you're going to do this, and they're on the lookout for messengers. So you get a failure rate. 5% of your messengers will die horribly. Now, if you send a message and you don't get any response, well, maybe your messenger got killed or maybe the, mess the, the acknowledgement response got killed. If you send a message and it did get through and the follower general sends a reply saying, yep, let's attack at dawn, and he receives no response. Well, he doesn't know, did you get it and then send a messenger back who then subsequent subsequently got killed or not? There is no solution. It's mathematically impossible to solve the problem. Uh, in the real world, you have things like TCP IP, which are good practical solutions where you have exponential back off and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but in general, it's, it's like a cap theorem. Mathematically, you can't solve it. So if you are building a message-based system, 
and you are relying on things like at most once or exactly once or at least once delivery, you're pretty much screwed because it, it won't work. It can sort of work until it doesn't. The only real way to deal with this is uh, to try and use as much item focus in your system as possible to allow messages to replay or to have a framework which will handle duplicates for you. Um, and there are other ways of dealing with, uh, which I'm not dealing here because we're not talking about data so much, but uh, makes transactions really possible, really difficult. So you have to do things like reservations instead, where you reserve a piece of data and work on it within a certain time frame. In any case, if you're looking at enterprise software products that promise this type of stuff, it doesn't work. Uh, and finally, fire and forget. So this is nice, this is fun. Um, We've seen this one, emergent behavior, um, where you've wired up the system, it's been running for several months, you've been doing continuous delivery, so people have been adding microservices, uh, lots of fun. Um, and uh, this makes it really, really difficult to debug the system because you don't know what, what service caused what cascade of messages. Um, a really important thing to do is to have a way to correlate messages between services. Uh, so if you look at the Seneca logs, again it might be kind of tricky to see, but you can see that each message has a message identifier or a transaction identifier. And you can go and uh, find the same identifiers in a big long list of logs, so I'm not going to look for here. But each message takes this correlation identifier with it as it transfers between microservices. And if a message causes a new message to be generated, um, you can see down here the transaction ID, which is the second part, is the same. So I can see that this message calls that message, calls that message, and so on. Uh, and obviously I have to use tooling and, and uh, log analysis and that sort of stuff to figure out what's going on. But at least I can. I've got the information. If you start building a microservice system where you aren't using correlation IDs, it's very, very hard to tell once the system gets big where things are breaking. Uh, what about if the initiator, due to a bug or whatever reason, generates the same message all the time? How do you do that case? So this is a this is this is a, this is a this is a very good this is a very good question because. Uh, we had a project recently where um, the mitigation code, and this code generating correlation IDs is mitigation code, itself had a bug. Uh, so the code that matched duplicates in the system um, caused a memory. So uh, it's kind of like the Byzantine generals issue where uh, you write this mitigation code, and the problem is the mitigation code itself may mess you up. Um, and that's absolutely a failure mode. A meta failure, failure mode, in fact. Uh, there's no easy answer for that. Um, and again, this is one of the reasons why uh, nowadays when we're building systems, uh, we don't just build them uh, from the ground up. It's really important to be using battle tested uh, libraries like the stuff from Netflix and all the different tools that are out there. Um, at least they've gone through several cycles of having stupid bugs like that. Uh, okay, so the other one, which is kind of like a, the, taking the, the emergent properties to the end, is where you have catastrophic collapse, where uh, there's some sort of feedback loop that keeps breaking things. You bring up service A, and you bring up service B, and it brings down service A, and then service B crashes, and no matter what you do, you can't bring the system back to health. Uh, it's really important to have kill switches so that you can take out ever larger sways of your system so that it, you, you can get back to some base case. Um, and this is actually kind of like a, a slightly more sophisticated version of having a, a static page on S3 if your entire site goes down, at least you're serving something. Okay, so um, when you're building a microservice system, it, it's really about adopting a philosophy or a style of building systems uh, that is different from traditional software engineering. So. Traditional software engineering, monolithic systems, asset transactions, all that sort of stuff, uh, unit tests and 
methodologies and acceptance testing and you know three months release cycles and code freezes and all that stuff is about trying to drive the probability of success to equal one. That, that's what it's about, right? It's you know the, the business doesn't accept failure. It's a computer. It has to get the right answer every time. Why does it? Why does? Why would it ever fail? Um, but of course, that's we know now. That's a broken philosophy. That's a, a broken approach because you're just beating your head against a brick wall trying to achieve the impossible. Microservices let you flip it around uh, in a practical way, where you're trying to build systems where the probability of failure is less than uh, some acceptable value. Uh, if you go and read the postmortem in uh, that Amazon wrote about that dynamo DB failure, uh, you know, about halfway down they talk about getting the system back to an acceptable failure. And Amazon always has that. They always have some level of errors they want to get down below. They're not trying to achieve perfection. Uh, and microservices, because of their nature, because there are these small pieces that you can replicate, that you can add more of, that you can measure. Uh, in, you know, in a simple case where you are given microservice as a probability of failure and you have more of them and your probability of failure goes down in a very specific way, you can control the level of failure. So you can say to the business, <coughs> what level of delivery do you want? What is the SLA that we have to meet? Uh, and it can, of course, it can never be perfection, but the business can specify epsilon or any value of epsilon. You can work out using relatively simple mathematical models based on message flows, what level of capacity and resources you need to meet that, and you can go back and say, okay, it's a million dollars versus a billion, maybe you want to change your epsilon. Um, but it changes, it changes the game from being deploy and pray and hope that everything stays up until it doesn't, to we actually have a measurable way of deciding how robust we are. Uh, so I'm going to finish up by giving you these three lines of code. So uh, these are the most important lines of code that you will ever write. If you can write a system where you can put these lines of code into every microservice and it still stays up, your service and your system will be incredibly robust. I challenge you. And, and uh, in all honesty, no, we haven't done it in production. Um, but it's fun to experiment with. Uh, thank you very much. Do you have any uh, questions? First of all, thanks for the talk. It was really good. Thanks for reminding me about the outage. It cost me half a Sunday and uh, <laughs> the start of the Formula One race. So thanks, Amazon. Uh, any questions? How do you sell the lowerment, uh, the lowering of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. So that's more of a that's more of a, a consulting business question than software, <laughs> but I, I'll take it. Uh, uh, it's it's about it's about setting things up the right way from the word go. Um, uh, by saying, okay, this is a business. How does the business make money? How do you measure how it makes money? Um, and then you say, okay, these are real numbers that you have to meet, and they generate a certain amount of return. And you don't want to spend 10 times the return just to get an extra nine of uptime. So you reduce the, the question to a financial model, which you can ask an accountant to work out. Um, so long as you start off in that vein, so long as you start off by using the, the magic word KPIs, uh, it's sort of a it's sort of a bait and switch, really, for the business people. You say, "What are the KPIs?" and then you go, "Oh, numbers," and then you can work it back down to epsilon. It's a, it's a very hard thing to sell if you don't really know how to negotiate it. Basically, uh, if you ask the business how long do you want to stay up, they would say 100% of the time. Uh, you know, yes, they will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, I think that's uh, and that's another interesting question because are are we not ethically required as engineers if we want to call ourselves that? And, and I know we're not actually engineers, right? We don't wear the the uh, the, the, the iron ring. Um, but if we want to become engineers, then we should be doing maths. We should be doing differential calculus. We should be knowing what our systems actually do scientifically, um, because then we can provide some sort of guarantees.
Uh, as opposed to, yep, yeah, I'll just work the weekend and it'll stay up. Are you getting messages routing? Is there like a centralized routing service that you put all the messages to, or are you just doing like multicast to all the listeners in the network? So, uh, the answer is uh, it depends. <laughs> uh, so, you, you, you have certain types of microservice approaches or systems where uh, there is just one way that the messages are transported. Um, so, you know, perfectly uh, large-scale systems have been built where all the messages just flow through Kafka and uh, microservices use zero MQ to come to Kafka, for example. Um, and other systems have been built using RabbitMQ and other systems have been built purely point-to-point -point HTTP using console to do uh, uh, service discovery. Uh, these are all perfectly valid mechanisms. Um, what I'm trying to... Uh, what I, what I, the idea that I'm trying to talk about is uh, that I, that question is actually not such an important question. Uh, it's much more important to understand the uh, the language of the messages that your system is building because this kind of maps into uh, the idea of the ubiquitous language in uh, domain-driven design, um, where you go from the business requirements to a set of messages to then an instantiation of a set of services which may change over time. And then how the services communicate um, depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you want low latency, you know, it's probably point to point, maybe it's even UDP, who knows. Um, if you want uh, an actor model, then you're going to use message queue, for example. Um, there isn't, so the framework that we use, there isn't uh, one central piece of magic that will just do the routing and work out all the patterns for you and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's more about enabling you to configure it and change it over time. And most importantly, allowing you to write the, in, the implementations without knowing how the transportation is going to work. Um, so it's kind of stepping back from that question saying, let's defer it until we have as much information as possible. Um, I was doing uh, microservices for the last couple of years, but most of them are like point to point HTTP with service discovery. This is the first time listening about pattern matching the messages and uh, uh, where we have like a, some kind of abstraction over the way the transfer happens. So is there something else where I can read upon to just understand what are the different mechanisms which I can do with pattern matching and what are the different things which I can do? Uh, is there anything else which I can Sure, so the, the Seneca site itself has a bit of documentation, but actually the best place to look is um, uh, Erlang. Uh, this is this pattern matching is directly inspired by the way that Erlang works. Um, and actually some of the uh, original work on uh, Scheme and Lisp and that sort of stuff. Um, so if you read some of uh, Alan Kay's original papers, um, he actually, the way he describes objects and methods, um, it's you're like, oh my god, that is microservices. Um, so these ideas have been around for a really, really long time. Uh, it's an aggressive decoupling mechanism. Um, so if you think about, uh, if you think about uh, Corba, and it's a little bit ironic talking about Corba in this building, um, you still had, <laughs> you still had the um, idea of object identity on the network. And the problem is that that's an address, in the same way that a URL is an address, in the same way that a message queue topic is an address. And if you have an address, or the same way that an in-memory uh, pointer to an object is an address, and as soon as, you have an, as soon as you have to address your messages, you're kind of screwed, because now you're coupled. Um, whereas a, a system that uses pattern matching just throws the messages to the winds and hopes. Um, but it usually works out. Also, like if you go down the line, one of the things point to point is that uh, you sort of reduce the number of messages. Like if you're going through a broker, in order to be for age to be, you're essentially duplicating the number of messages that are going through your system, right? And I'm just curious, just be aware of your thoughts on that. So it has an impact, absolutely. There is an implicit trade-off between uh, throughput and latency. So, in order to achieve high latency, uh, or sorry, low latency, uh, point to point is the way to go, absolutely. Um, 
But there are large numbers of cases where the latency doesn't matter that much. What matters much more is being able to do continuous delivery by attaching new things to the message queue and that sort of stuff. Um, and also, there's a, there's a power law that applies to the size of systems, right? So not all systems are as big as, as you guys. Um, there are large numbers of systems which are much, much smaller. Where the, the median system, median system isn't, that, isn't that big. It's only got a couple of thousand users. Um, so the, the, the average number of internal applications in, the, in a Fortune 500 company is about 12,000. 12,000 separate applications. Uh, VB applications, Java, Ruby, Perl, all sorts of mad things. Applications at that scale uh, benefit much more from continuous delivery uh, than being able to get the maximum performance because the marginal cost of adding another 10 AWS instances is nothing compared to three months of optimizing. No, it's all sort of in the same like the complexity of the microservice architecture you talk about troubleshooting, like isolated errors and things that happen and it seems to be quite complex. Yes, yeah, it is more complex, absolutely. Complexity doesn't go away, you've shifted it to a slightly different place. Uh, that's why microservices without continuous delivery um, is a, kind of a bad place to be. Because actually what you want to be is you want to be in a place where you have a microservice system. It's kind of like uh, mathematical induction, right? You, you start with one microservice in week one, and then you write another one and you add it to your system and you measure the effect that it has on the system. So you never change the system en masse. You never add like a whole bunch of microservices. You're always adding an individual instance of an individual version of an individual microservice and then validating in production that everything is still okay. Most of the time, uh, that means that you only accrete complexity slowly and you, kind of, you still kind of understand what's going on. Um, but sometimes it also leads to catastrophic failure and all sorts of weird stuff. Um, yes, it is a downside. This is a trade-off. It makes continuous delivery uh, much easier. In fact, uh, for very large-scale systems, uh, they, they tend to train back a little bit towards the monolith because uh, if you need to uh, reduce complexity or refactor, sometimes you actually take microservices and put them into one unit. Um, but you only do that after the system requirements are stabilized. sharing messages across areas, so isolated data failures, you're struggling how you manage that within your architecture. And what you're talking about. Uh, so, I think it's all part of the same, it's all, it, it's all part of the same issue, really. Um, so, the, the, I mean, again, uh, if you've reached the point where uh, you have that level of complexity, um, it's probably because you don't have sufficient monitoring in place to begin with. Um, so if, you're, if, if, you, if you don't have the ability to invest in the deployment infrastructure and automation and the monitoring quite aggressively at the start, uh, you can get away with 10 or 20 microservices and maybe still have a, a monolithic database. That's not going to be too harmful. Um, but if you're going to build 50 microservices and they're all going to control their own data, but you haven't put any of the automation in place, um, that's, that, that's, that's a bad place to be. Yeah, One more question? Yes. Uh, that, was no. kind of, that was kind of the point <laughs> I was going to make. Um, I, I think just in, in, in general, I think it's not so much that it's more complex. In fact, if you've got a, uni uh, if you've got a, a uniform uh, messaging system, you take a lot of the complexity out. But the difficulty is being able to reason about a system that's distributed across lots of different places with lots of different microservices. So I think tooling is much more important than it ever was before. And in order to try and analyze failure modes in a microservices-based system, you need really good tooling. Yeah, I, that, that's it in a nutshell. It's, uh, you can't just... You can't just jump into micro microservices the way you might have said. Oh, let's let's do Ruby on Rails, and you know we'll do um, you know uh, convention over configuration because that's a great new way to build software. Microservices is not that is not as forgiving. Um, it's very easy to get started and end up in a bad place very quickly. Um, and you'll see 
stories, war stories on the web, if you, if you read blog posts about people saying, why do microservices fail for us? Like, there's a ton of those. Um, and they're to be learned from. Okay.